Take off your grave clothes. You know, I was thinking about uh, several months ago, I got the flu. And, uh, and we live in a two-story house. And at, at that time, that was 18 months now. He was probably 10 or 11 months. And uh, so I got the flu. And Sa- Sandra, she made me go up in the, in the theater room. And I was, nobody could come up there. I couldn't come down. She, like, hoisted food up on a rope or something. And uh, well, quite that bad. But she like sprayed Lysol up and down the whole way, and and uh, but I mean I was sick, sick, and I'm not I'm usually a, a, somebody that doesn't get sick very often, but this time the flu got me, and um, it was one of those summer flus too. If you ever had the, the flu in the summer, it, I, I think it's worse than the the, the flu in the winter, because everything's hot and and. Um, so the first three days of the flu, man, I would just post it up on the couch and lay down. I think I slept most of the time those three days. And by the third day in, my throat started hurting. And I couldn't hardly swallow. And I was just, I, I, I told Sandra, I think I got strep throat. And uh, so here I go back to the doctor. And uh, they, the lady says, uh, you look familiar. I was like, yeah, I was just here a couple of days ago. I had the flu. But my, something's going on with my, my throat. And then sure enough, I had strep throat. And so that put me down for another couple of days. And I'm telling you, that was one of the toughest sicknesses that I've ever been through. I've had back surgeries and all, other, all these other things. But this flu and this strep throat, like, put me uh, on the couch. And um, while, while I was up there, the only thing I could think about was getting well. That was the only thing. You know, I would hear the baby from the downstairs. He would stand at the bottom of the stairs, and we have the gate where he can't get up there. Dad, 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 dad. Dad, 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 dad. And I so wanted to go down there and get him, but I couldn't. So the only thing I was thinking about was getting well. And that, I think it was Friday or Saturday, I finally got up out of the bed. And, and uh, that was Friday because everybody was gone to work. And I got the Lysol out, and I started spraying everything down and spraying every, everything. I took off these old clothes, and I threw them over in the corner. I went and got in the shower. Man, that was one of the best showers I've ever had, you know. So I get in the shower, and I get back out of the shower. I looked over in the corner, and it was the pile of clothes that I had that were sitting there from all the clothes that I sweated through over and over again all week. And that, those clothes there were a representation of, of that week that I had. Of that week that I had, it was just sickness. And, and uh, man, I was totally done with all that, that nasty sickness stuff. But, you know, I got to thinking, would I ever just go back over there and pick those clothes up and put them back on and go to work in those clothes? I would never do that, right? But I think a lot of times in our life, we get caught up of going back to the old sick things that we do, the things that bring us spiritually down. And I seen that when I was reading the scripture here in John chapter 11, verse 38 and four, uh, through 44, it says, Jeep, uh, Jesus was deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a, a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. They did, although Martha objected. By this time, there was a very bad odor, for he has been there for four days. But Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man, by this time, there is a bad odor, for there had been there for four days. I guess I put that in twice. Then Jesus said, I did not tell you. Did I I not tell you? Okay. I'm going to start this over again. Goodness gracious. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stones. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said When he said this, Jesus called a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with the strips of linen and clothes around his face and cloth around his face. Jesus said, take the grave clothes off and let him go. You see, here was Lazarus dead, right? 
And they begged Jesus to come. Well, Jesus was busy doing some other things earlier in the chapter, and, and, um, and he didn't make it in time for, for what, what Lazarus' last breath was going to be, but he, Jesus got there in time. But this was one of those great challenges in, in, in Jesus' ministry, if you look at it from, from the worldly view, seeing a dead man laying there, and then it's okay, Jesus, he died, now what are you going to do? Um, but tonight, I want to talk to you about three things. Three things. Jesus had a challenge in front of him. He could have came right then, and he could have just saved Lazarus before he died. But even in that verse, Jesus says, look, I'm doing this so the others around me would believe. For the others around it. Because Jesus knew that the people around him, the people that he's already performed miracles before in front of, had doubts what Jesus could do. So the very first thing I want to talk about tonight, it says, what does your tomb smell like? What does your tomb smell like? John chapter 11, 38 and 39 says, Jesus was deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. They did, although Martha objected. By this time, there was a bad odor for he had been there for four days. See, the stench of our sins can always be hid behind things in your life. See, the stench of the dead man Lazarus was behind this large stone. But I think a lot of times that we think the things in our life are going to go unseen, they're going to go unheard because we hide them behind this thing called life. We're hiding behind the, 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 the perfections of our makeup and the perfections of our fancy clothes and the perfections that we, that we followed up and that we made in our ministries. But eventually the stink of our sins is going to penetrate through those things and people are going to begin to see through the things in your life. See, those sins are keeping us from the relationship that we need from, with God. It's keeping us from those long times. You know, a, a lot of us say that, man, I've been praying for this one thing for so long. And, and we have these long time prayers that we've been praying for, but we still haven't received them yet. And I would ask you to begin to examine your life and see if there's some things in your life that we need to get rid of and make room for, for the things that God is trying to give you. There might be some family issues that you need to take care of or some brokenness, or some unhappiness in your life. But there's some things that we're not giving up to God to make that room. See, in Jeremiah 5 and 25, and I didn't give you this scripture, it says, your wrongdoings have kept these blessings away. Your sins have deprived you from God. Wow. The first time I read that scripture, I was like, dear Lord, whatever that is, just remove it from me. Because I don't want nothing in my life that prevents me from God. And it says it right there. I say in 59 and 2, it says, your iniquities have separated you from God. Our iniquities, the things in our life, the things that when God looks at, to, looks at he's like, no, I want no parts of that. The only thing that separates us from God is the iniquities in our life, the sins in our life. Listen, I said the only thing that separates us from God, not God's love. God, God will always love you. But from those blessings, from those things that you're asking him for, from that, that relationship, that personal close relationship, those things are going to separate you from God because of those sins. So what does your tomb smell like today? Or oh, some things in your life that we need to get rid of, or some things in your life that are they're they're not kosher any longer. You know, every time we go grocery shopping, we go in the refrigerator, we clean the refrigerator out. And I and, and I, I I when I look at the refrigerator and I open it up, it's like opening up our lives, right? There's some good stuff in there, but there, sometimes there's the spaghetti that's been in there for maybe a day or two too long. 
Right, and then, and then I tell you today, there's some things that we've been playing with in our life that have been in your life a, a day or two too long, that you've been messing around a little bit too long, and God's saying tonight you need to release those things. He said tonight He's trying to He's trying to take you out of the tomb, but we can continue to get back to the grave clothes. God has already delivered us from these things, and we continue to go back to the grave and put on the grave clothes. Number two, we, a lot of us probably have seen this movie, uh, movie, I can't speak tonight, Show Me the Honey. See, most of y'all know about Show Me the Money. But Show Me the Honey, right? We always want God's blessings. We live, we, we don't think God is real unless he's blessing us left and right or he's doing his miracles. We're always a miracle to miracle with God. If God ain't doing a miracle in our life today or he ain't giving us a blessing today, oh, but my faith is done dropped. I don't know if God's real any longer. Well, show me the honey. Show me the sweet stuff. If I can't see God, you, you work. And if I can't feel you, God, if I can't hear you, let me tell you, there's going to be times in our life that we're not going to be able to see God, that we're not going to be able to feel God, that we don't even know God's there. But listen, it's our job to continue to feed ourselves, to get onto our word, to continue to move on. When we can't feel him. Believe me, that's the way I felt when I had this rider. Like, God, where are you at? I can't do this without you, God. But listen, I knew he was there. I could have just said, you know what? I can't hear from God right now. So I'm going to just lay this thing down. But listen, I got young people depending on me every week. I got people depending on me to continue to push through. God has prepared me for the moment that I can't hear him. He's prepared me for that time. He didn't leave me hanging. He didn't leave me out there without the education, without the understanding, without the knowledge. No, he prepared me to that point, and he says, okay, I prepared you. Now go and do it. Right? When you graduate high school, you graduate college. They prepared you for the next step. My wife is going back to college. <laughs> I think she's been going to college for, we've been married almost 16 years. I think she's been going to college for 14. It's not been that much, but my, my wife is a very intelligent woman. She's got her master's degree and now she's going back to get more. And uh, she's like, how do you think, uh, this don't have nothing to do with my message. She said, what about if I make more money? You know, I said, bring, bring it home. <laughs> Man, if your wife, wife makes more money, you just celebrate. <laughs> Hallelujah. As long as she's bringing it home to you and not Sancho, you're good. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, show me the honey. <laughs> oh, man. Where do I get? How do I get here? Listen, God has prepared you for a time like this. Every step in your life, God is preparing you for the next step. But there's going to be times that he's going to release your hand and let you go and do it. But if you haven't spent the time in the word, you haven't spent the time when you need. Listen, at some time, your mom wants you out. Okay? At some time, time you're 40 and you're still living in the garage. Okay? She's going to want you out. She's going to want you out before they retire. I promise you that, right? God is saying, look, man, I've prepared you. I need you to go. I need you to, to take this ministry that I've given you, and, and I need you to take it and, and do something with it. But see, a lot of times we're like Martha objecting to the removal of the stones in our life. How many of us have been there that we have, we have these things that we believe that, that God can do certain things, but when it comes to the big things, when it comes to the big stones in our life, then we're not, we're not real sure. Well, God, I know that, God, I know that you can keep Lazarus from dying, but I don't know if you can raise Lazarus from the dead. When I read this scripture, that's what I was feeling like Martha was saying. Like, whoa, 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 whoa God, don't open that unless you can finish what you're starting. But I, and so many times in our life, it's the same way. 
We get up to God, we have the, the faith that God can do certain things, but when it gets past what we can, what we can think and what our ideas about things are, we don't know if we can trust in God. Let me tell you, your relationship with God has just started when you lose all ideas of what God can do. When you quit thinking about what you know that God can do and what you think God can do, that is just the very tips of what, what he's able to do. But we put God in this box and we says, okay, God can do this. And then when it goes above that and when it comes to big stones and big things in our life, okay, God, you stay right here. I'm going to handle this. And when I need your help, I'll call you. We have to have the faith that Martha did when they called Jesus to prevent Lazarus from dying. Not the faith of Martha when Jesus showed up and says, I, whoa, whoa, Jesus, don't start nothing you can't finish. Show me the honey. She was just saying, show me the things that, that you can do right now. If I can't see it, I can't believe it. I don't have the faith enough to walk it out on my own. I don't have the, the faith enough to do these things, Father, when I can't feel you, when I can't hear you, when I can't see you. I need you to move every step. I need you to be in front of me doing miracles so I can follow, follow that. I need you to continue to bless me every step of the way. Listen, it's, it's called a narrow path for a reason because sometimes it's going to get hard. Sometimes it's not going to be easy. That's why it's so important that we have people around us. See, when we're on the wide path of destruction, that we can just, we can go all over the, the road and we can make mistakes and we can do whatever and, and we're still on the road and we're still just kind of flowing along with life. But we're on this narrow path that God has called us on. There's not much room for mistake. That's why we have to have godly people around us. That we will make mistakes. Okay, brother, come on, y'all. I know you're, you're veering off the road. Come on, we need you right here. Like, well, we need mentors in our life. Hey, come on, brother. Hey, that, was, that wasn't right to get back on the road. I know you're losing your faith. It's okay. God's still the same as he was yesterday when he was blessing you. Today he ain't doing nothing, but he's still the same God. He's still the same God. See, God is trying to do a, a new work in our life. And, and, and move some big things in our life. But we're not ready for that. We want, we want God to do the things we want God to do. And I got quiet in here. Can I say we want God to change the things we want God to change? Oh, give myself away. I told y'all I can't sing. I give myself away. Oh, oh but not, I, I didn't really mean that, God. I didn't really mean all that. Just this stuff on this side. I, I've already sorted it out for you, God. You take care of this stuff. Listen, I got a plan, God. How many of us got a plan for God? Instead of God's plan for our life. But we're, we need that miracle. When things go wrong, we want to blame our pastor and our teachers and our preachers and our husbands and our wives. Instead of looking into that mirror and saying, you know what? You know what, God? I made some mistakes. I, I separated some things in my life. And you know what? If I would have gave you all the big stuff instead of keeping you, allowing you to take the easy stuff, and the, everything would have been different. But we continue to play games with God and we just living off miracle and miracle and blessing the blessing. And they continue to feed ourselves no matter what. And they continue to feed ourselves. You know, I've had people come up to come up to me in ministry throughout the years and saying, you know, if it wasn't for if it was for you and not doing this and that, then my son or my daughter or my nephew or or my husband would have would have been still serving God. I'm just and I'm puzzled by that. You know, we get five hours a week. 
to feed into the lives of the people here at the church. You get the rest, but then when it comes, our fault, because we're not feeding ourselves at home. We're not feeding into our, our husbands. We're not feeding into our kids. If we make them go to church, but then we don't make them do the things that what the Bible says at home. I heard this, this guy say, if you take your son and your daughter's fishing and hunting now, you owe me fishing and hunting for your kids later on in life. See, what we need to do is we need to invest in our kids' life now. We need to invest into our circle now so we're not going out later trying to find them to invest in. We have this, this thing in our life that we have this crisis God. A crisis God. It's like the crisis hotline. When things get bad, we call them up. Oh, God, what am I going to do now? He's like, I don't know. You started it. <laughs> what are you going to do? Right? Crisis hotline. You know, one of the angels pick up. No, he's, he's, doing, he's helping some people out over here that trust him all the way. <laughs> I don't know if that's biblical or not, but. <laughs> but listen, God is not there just for your crisis. He's there to nurture you. He's there to guide you. He's there to direct you. He's there to give you wisdom. He's there to pluck some things out of your life that's going to hurt. But you know what? He's there to fulfill those needs in your life that's going to, when he takes those things out, when he reopens up the, the doors of your life and he sees the rotten and he begins to pull it out, guess what he has over on the counter in the H-E-B bag? The good stuff. The good stuff. The old rotten tomatoes at the bottom that you didn't quite get eaten and then he puts that fresh stuff right in there for you. That fresh manta from heaven. But we got to remove the old. We got to remove the old. Number three, are you raised from the dead or you're lowering into the grave? Jesus called with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen, cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off those grave clothes and let him go. Here we are standing today, a new creation, a new person. We've been raised from that spiritual death. And we're rejoicing with, with God and saying, Lord, thank you. And we're moving around and we're doing the things that, 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 that high that we get from being saved or from being baptized or from being, you know, the, the rededicated. And we move around for a week or two and then we want to tell everybody about everything. And, and all these things are going on. And then what? Life happens. And then we forget about that visit with Jesus that we had. Now, could you imagine Lazarus being raised from the dead? And Jesus says, come on out there, boy. Come on. Friend, come here. Take that stuff off. Take those grave clothes. And he gives him a hug. And Mary and Martha are excited doing cartwheels. And hey, it's over. everything's good. And Lazarus goes out. And he's doing life again. And <coughs> starts getting sick. He's got just an everyday common cold. And then Lazarus just runs to the tomb. Wraps himself up. Puts himself back in the tomb and closes the door. I think in life, a lot of times we do that same thing. Life happens. And then we go right back to the places that we were. You see, we begin to beat certain things in life and certain sins in our life and certain relationships that we remove ourselves from. And then we begin to flirt around the edges of those things. And as we begin to flirt around the edges, then before we know it, we're right back in the middle of the sin. We're over there sitting on the curb 
wrapping ourselves with those strips of linen and people was walking by, hey man, what are you doing? Oh man, I'm just preparing for this death. Are you sick? No. What's going on? Well, you know, some things are going on in my life. I'm just, just getting ready for the end. As Christians, that's what we do. We just can't pick ourselves up and say, you know what, Lord, forgive me for the things that I've done. God, I know that you're a God of mercy and grace. I know that you've come and you sent your son to die for me because you knew this day that I was going to mess up and you know I was going to come to my knees and I'm going to say, Lord, forgive me. But instead of we just bound ourselves up with these grave clothes, we begin to put the stuff back over us and then the shame comes in and we begin to put the cloth over our heads because we're ashamed about all the things that we've done in life. And the enemy's just there saying, yeah, you don't deserve any of this. Keep on wrapping yourself up. And the Lord's coming by and said, Lazarus, what are you doing? Micah, what are you doing? George, what are you doing? I've come to give you life, not death. I've come to give you life. But here we are, returning to the, the tomb. Second Corinthians 5 and 17 says that we are new creations in Christ. The old one is gone. And a new life has begun. He's saying, look, all that stuff, all that stuff, I'm just I'm just making sure they weren't here before I'm, I was just ministering to some people last night. And they were just telling me that, that they know they disappointed God and that's why they can't come back to church anymore. I begin to break my heart. Because these people I loved, family. I can't come back to church because I know I've disappointed God. And I was just like, what? The enemy is lying to you. Run back to him. He's waiting for you with his arms open. And he wants you to run back to him. I invite him to our Sunday school class and I invite him to church today. And to tell you the truth, I was looking at the door. 9 10. Kind of got disappointed. 9 15. I said, Well, let's go ahead and shut the door. Let's get started. <laughs> the door was closing. Oh, no, they're catch the door. Here they come in. <laughs> oh, come, y'all, come on in. Come on in. Say, listen, there's people around us. There was people around Lazarus. There was people around Mary and Martha, right? They, they, they called Jesus because they knew there was something going on with Lazarus' life. They called us last night because they knew, they knew there was something going on with them. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know that they needed us to come over there and tell them that they needed to run back to Jesus. But all they knew, they was hurting, and they didn't know why. Listen, it's not even in my notes. I don't know why I'm telling you, but listen, run back to Jesus. Doesn't matter what it is. How big or how small. Listen, the small stuff, run back to Jesus. Because the, when you just kind of continue to flirt around stuff, listen, it's going to turn into bigger sin. My life proves it. Your life proves it. Our off our life proves it. You got to run back to Jesus. Take the grave clothes off. Quit messing around with those stinky, sinful, sick stuff. See, we have to beat those habits. We've beat those habits. We have the power and the understanding and the strength of the living God standing behind us to push us through. When things are hard, you see, maybe it's the tendency to use people or to hurt people, to walk over people. You know, so these, these are some of the things in my life that, that God has freed me from when I was in the world. 
You know, there was a time in my life where whatever I wanted to do and however I wanted to do it, I would use people and as pawns and different things and set them up the way that I could get what I wanted. But listen, God has freed me from those things. God has freed you from the victories, freed you from the things in your life, and he's given you victory of those things. All those times that Jesus showed up and, and, and moved back to stone in your life, and he says, look, let me do that. Let me do the big things. And he's called you out of that tomb, and he says, look, take those grave clothes off. And we can be freer than we've ever been before. But we have a tendency to run back to those grave clothes. We have a tendency to go back to the things that we've always done. Because a lot of times, listen church, a lot of times it's easy to do the things that we've always done even though it hurts. Because we're comfortable there. But listen, Jesus has showed up in your life and he's rolled back that stone. He says, and I give you life. And I've removed the death and I've given you life. I've given you life over the drugs. I've given you life over the alcohol. I've given you life over the prostitution. I give you life over the, the things that are going on in your home. I give you the life over the things that your father has done to you. I give you life over the things this world has shown you that is right, that is wrong. I've given you that life. I give you a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a fifth chance. I'm just, all the chances he's given me. Listen, yeah, we're going to battle it one day at a time. Let me, let me tell you, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. We're going to battle it one day at a time. Every day you wake up, we're going to battle those things. When, when, I, when, I, when I first came out, out of the world and into this Christian walk, man, there was some years, some years went by that there was a couple things in my life that I didn't battle every day. Every day. But listen, years later, he's given me life. Listen, he's rolled back those stones. He rolls back those stones and listen, now when I show up to my, my tomb, I'm say, it says, this is where David was. Never to come back again. There ain't even the big stone. Somebody else already used it down the way a little bit. The stone is removed. God is beginning to take the, listen, God is beginning to take those big things out of my life. Because why? Because I say, God, take this stuff. Take it. Take it. You know how I pray now? God, I want you to show me the things in my life that I'm doing wrong. I remember when I was a kid, we was at the old church, and Brother Joe Wright would come. And Joe Wright, he would like, you stand up. And he would read your mail, right? And let you know all. If it was a good thing, a bad thing, it could be anything. And us as, as youth, we, uh, we sat to the right, the first three rows or whatever it was on the front. We always sat in the front. When Brother Joe Wright came, we scattered. Right? We, like, everybody had their own little idea about how not getting the pick. Well, if you sit on the front row and you look him in the eye, he ain't going to think anything you've done is wrong. So, but if you sit in the back row and you don't give him an eye, he won't pick you. you know? So we all had these, these ideas of how not to get picked by Brother Joe Wright. But today, when there's a minister that comes like that, I'm like, pick me. Pick me, right? If it's good or bad, listen. If it's bad, listen, I want to know if it's bad. If there's something in my life that I need to fix, listen, pick me. It might be an embarrassing for a minute in front of the whole church. But listen, it's going to be a whole lot better when it's over. Pick me. Because I allow God to take all of the big things in my life. But we still have to battle. The enemy's still after us. Every single day he's after us. Pick me. 
get rid of those grave clothes. Verse 43, it says, take off the grave clothes and let him, it doesn't say this, but it says, I say, let him or her go. And if you finally are getting well, there's no reason for us to return back to the old dead clothes. If God has saved you from those old things, if I had them old nasty flu clothes, flu clothes right here, and old strep throat clothes, ain't none of you. If I say, here, anybody want these? Y'all would think I was the sickest man alive, right? No, you'd be like, no, them things should be burned. But listen, our spiritual side of us will just crawl right back into them. Oh, this feels so good. Let me tell you, God has saved us from those things. God God has saved us from this. He's saying today, take off them grave clothes. Take them off. Take them off. 